have a presentation coming from one of the nonprofits um, that was on um, the wish list, uh, Councilwoman uh, Porterfield. Do we have representatives here from, from Gideon's Army? Okay, if you can, if you can just come to the lectern up there, state your name, position within the organization, and if you can provide um, budget and finance committee members and Metro Council members, and also the, the view and audience, um, just the mission, um, where you are as it relates to, to financials, um, the overall size of your organization, your board of directors, and, and so forth. Um, that information uh, was communicated to um, uh, Ms. Fertuga. I don't know if she's here or not, yes, but uh, you can go ahead. Pull well, the microphone down and you're on. Yes, we waiting on uh, our founder. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, can you give us a few minutes? Okay, what I'll do, we're gonna go ahead and proceed um, uh, with our agenda for today, and then I'll call you back up. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much for being here. Okay, just a reminder um, to budget and finance committee members and, and Metro Council members, um, this is our, our, our second budget work session um, at the request of council members from our last work session that this work session was needed. Hopefully everyone got in their amendments um, to the CIB. We will have a joint meeting tomorrow, a budget and finance, a planning and zoning and historical committee to review and consider those amendments. That meeting starts tomorrow at five o'clock. Also tomorrow we will have an adjourned council meeting as it relates to um, the CIB um, per charter. Um, you are aware that we have to have that um, adopted uh, by June, June 15th. Um, with that, I do see we have Councilman Sledge here. Um, Councilman Sledge, your communication um, was shared today, um, and I believe that it will be uploaded to the SharePoint um, just for the benefit of budget and finance and committee members and council members that's here in attendance. If you can walk us through um, your supplement, only if uh, the tax rate correction uh, substitute is adopted. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Um, yes, so uh, for members to know, and I do have copies if you need one. So um, I have submitted a budget supplement proposal um, and had to submit it by last Friday for reasons I will explain. Um, that if a, if a, well, I will say a revenue increase were passed by this body, it would be, it would appropriate 10.5 million from the excess or additional revenues, unappropriated revenues, um, into certain areas. The main area it would appropriate into is MTA. So as we're aware, MTA's got 8.6 million it's looking at having to, or 8.7 million it's looking at having to cut for various reasons. Uh, the subsidy I have proposed within the supplement is 8.2, and I wanted to give just brief context on that. Um, as we know from MTA's budget hearing back in February, um, they have tier two services that they would like to provide, uh, which mostly center around uh, extended weekend and late night service on major corridors throughout their throughout the county. Um, and it also includes service uh, for more mobility on demand and access ride service, which traditionally is used by seniors and folks who have maybe differently abled who need that door-to-door -door service. Um, so the intent of the 8.2 is that 5.3 of it would go to fund those services, those tier two services, and then the remaining 2.9 could be used as what I'm calling breathing room um, for MTA um, in order for them to consider uh, the services that they're potentially reducing. Why is that important? Well, because MTA goes their board will be voting on June 27th about all of the suggestions that they have made regarding fare increases, service cuts, service changes, consolidations, the whole kit and caboodle. And I wanna make sure that they have the ability to say, we need more input on routes A, B, and C, then we have the time, flexibility, and funding to do so. I do wanna point out that within MTA's documents, those service cuts and changes their own documents say would occur on or around August 1st. So I think everybody in this body is aware of what August 1st is. 
and I have a real hesitation about cutting service on election day and people walking out to their bus stop and potentially not knowing that the bus isn't coming. Um, the rest of the appropriations uh, fall into five categories. The biggest one after that is 1.6 million for the library. Uh, we had testimony in uh, our, parks, uh, our Parks Library and Arts Committee a couple of meetings ago that the collections were being reduced by 1.6 million, and we were told that that essentially set back collections six years um, in the library, so that would restore this funding. There's 480,000 for six additional fire department positions in the USD that was um, expressed, I think, by several members at varying levels of staffing, but that is where I landed. Um, and then the final three are doing another allocation for historical markers like we did a couple of years ago where every district in the county is able to fund one, uh, restoring the money for NECAT, um, that the 50,000 that was discussed, and then 50,000 to go toward the Fort Negley archeological study. For those who may not be familiar, um, there has been a crowdfunding effort for the archaeological study that has been going on for probably the last six months, and it has not been able to raise the 50000 um, In contrast, we sold the sound scoreboard, the big guitar scoreboard, to go down the street um, for more than $50,000. So there is, a, there is a way to, to, to fund this. I'm not saying that's one for one. The 50000 actually comes out of the, out of the appropriation from the new budget. If you would like a copy, I have a copy of the resolution. It will be filed and show up Wednesday for the agenda for June 18th. However, our body will not consider it June 18th because per our rules, the finance department has 20 days to consider. That is why I filed it last week so that they could start reviewing um, that filing and that we could potentially, and I want to stress that underline italicize, potentially consider this uh, supplement at our July 2nd meeting. Um, but again, Chair Lady, as you indicated, it would only be possible with a revenue increase. Um, so I hope I've explained this as, as clear as mud, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Councilman Sledge. Any questions? Um, I know many of you may not have actually um, have read it yet. It came uh, midday. I believe it was forwarded to, to council members. So just want to give you a follow-up from my last budget work session as it relates to um, the social services request. There were some additional questions as it related to um, that, that amount. That's the HMIS for the Homeless Impact Division. This information is also on the, the SharePoint drive. Um, and this, uh, the response uh, came back from Director Tackett Essentially, the $150,000 um, would potentially be used for two FTEs for the HMIS um, and the CE uh, 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 database uh, entry system. Um, the HMIS, basically, for the viewing audience, is Homeless Management Information Systems, and that's the database that allows community to co coordinate services for people experiencing homelessness. And CE stands for a coordinated entry. Um, this will allow um, just a central location repository as it relates for um, information to, to be entered. Um, she says she's currently working on um, a grant from HUD, um, which is $141,508. Um, up to 150000 for a one-time two-year grant for HUD as it relates to M M HMIS training over the next two years. Um, she will be putting in a 4% request uh, for $32,100 for an increase um, in the software cost. Um, she doesn't um, outline where, uh, where she's at as it relates to communications. Uh, uh, with the administration and finance re regarding that. But I did want to let you know, because I had it on my sheet here um, to follow up, there was additional questions as it related to um, that wish list request. Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just add one other thing, since I'm on one of the committees that works on capacity building for the HMIS, that also having this in place enables a person who's experiencing homelessness not to have to go through the same application process when they're going to three different agencies because once it gets input, then the next agency can say, oh, I see you filled all this out, so they don't have to go through the, you know, sometimes the trauma of, of you know, dealing with the fact that they can't find information and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's beneficial in terms of helping us get additional funding 
because we have the data that we need to and also just for serv serving the, the population in a, in, a, in a better way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Allen. I also wanna add to you um, from the director's communication, she indicates that she's been um, consulting with IT as it relates to this process and it would not um, require additional support from them. She said the cost is neutral um, to IT. So that $150,000 is, is the true cost uh, for that HMIS uh, slash CE, CE system uh, for, the, for the two FTEs. Any further discussion? We're waiting on um, uh, Gideon's army. Uh, I believe they are, they are here. There's a request for, for council members for you to fully understand their mission and their charge due to was a request from, from a council member on the, the budget wish list. And we do have some departments here, so committee members, council members, if you have any additional questions, you can take this opportunity to ask any additional questions you may have also. This will be our last budget work session. You can come on up, we were waiting. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Those and traffic lights aren't synchronized, are they? <laughs> I think they were working against me. I think everything was working against me to get here. So hopefully y'all show me some grace and blessings for what I've been through. <laughs> we will, just for the viewing audience, go ahead and state your name and your organization that you represent. My name is Rashida Fatuga and I am here to represent Gideon's Army, Grassroots Army for Children. Thank you for being here, Ms. Fatuga. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Um, Gideon's Army is here to ask the council for um, financial support because when we came last year, we had asked, uh, presented that we had started or were starting a violence interruption program and we didn't have any staff. Um, it was really just a vision and we've raised enough money that we've been able to hire um, seven staff, five are full-time, two are part-time, and it's for a, a cure violence-based violence interruption program. And so we've brought cure violence to Nashville and uh, they've done an assessment and we've done training. Like these are all things that we couldn't do before. And so we're really taking the initiative to uh, as a community group to try and stop violence in Nashville, but starting with the 37208 community, because that is the, that's what we have the capacity to deal with, with where we are. It costs $150,000 just to contract with Cure Violence. And um, that's their training and technical assistance fee, which Gideon's Army is still in the process of trying to raise. Um, because usually what happens is that cities or state agencies directly contract with Cure Violence and then find a community organization to um, run the program. But we could see that that wasn't gonna be able to happen here because of the, the budget and, and everything. Um, not that it's not a priority to our council or to our mayor. Um, and so Gideon's Army took the initiative to raise as much money as we can. And so um, what we have now, we've got mentors, we have our violence interrupters, and what they do every day is they're in the communities, they're building relationships with the children and the families, they're out in the streets in the afternoons, they're in the streets at night. Um, 
they we respond to trauma we have a trauma responder who goes into the home and um who meets with families when a homicide has occurred with the money that you all give us she's our trauma responder is part-time we would be able to make her full-time which means that it would be um, a quicker response and we have a little bit more capacity to handle because it's a lot of shootings and, um, that happen in the 37208 community. So she would be able to respond at the hospital level. So like as soon as um, a shooting occurs, she can be with the family at the hospital as opposed to having only 20 hours a week. It's not as much that she can do, but she meets with them. She connects them with resources. She helps them with victims' compensation. She's planned full funerals with the families and then meets with them weekly. And what it does is it helps to kind of diffuse some of the anger and help to prevent retaliations and make connections with the violence interrupters who can then maybe meet with other family members who might need support. Because in order for the violence interruption program to work, you have to have relationships with the people. And so that's why um, her position is important and why it's also important for them to be in the communities. Uh, we've been uh, at Pearl Cone High School and uh, we've done a lot of work there. I don't wanna say too much because I'm not supposed to talk about the schools and fundraising at the same time, but in general, in schools, what we do is um, we have a series of programs. So using research-based best practices, we work to reduce community health inequities, increase student attendance and achievement, improve school culture, reduce student behavior infractions, and reduce and eliminate community violence. We use art-based trauma and restorative justice interventions to help youth and their families heal and develop a greater sense of safety and bonding. So um, we have community-based strategic peace building, that's the violence interrupters. If there is a shooting or a homicide within 24 to 48 hours, our violence interrupters are set to be able to respond and hopefully prevent future retaliations or the community actually will reach out to them if there is a conflict um, before they even do anything like we've had students maybe who are forgotten because they're not the typical students who are in trouble but they're feeling angry and these kids have access to guns out here and they will call us instead of going out and trying to retaliate against someone maybe who's killed a brother or a father um, community-based restorative justice diversion. The community is able to come in and request for circles, peace circles, healing circles, um, any kind of restorative-based interventions. Um, we also have the zone, which is an in-school alternative to suspension and expulsion. And um, uh, we've seen, I think uh, last year was over 320 students went through that program in one school. It was about 150. And I really believe and, and that, I mean, well, we know that there were fewer student infractions because we included more social emotional learning programs. We included mentoring. So the, the students weren't really getting in trouble as much. So we have fewer kids to come through our program. And what we do with the zone is we give students the opportunity to talk about whatever happened between them and a teacher or them and another student, whatever the reason is um, that the teacher reached out to us in order to get support. And they're able to brainstorm and figure out ways to rebuild this relationship with the teacher. And then we meet with the teacher or we provide information to the teacher um, that's requested so that they know how to go back and repair the relationship with the student and how to help the student make better choices in the future. Or if it wasn't even something something a student did. Maybe the teacher has space to also reflect on how to be a better teacher because as a former teacher, we all need that type of support. Um, going in and doing some coaching, teaching uh, teachers how to make agreements with their classes. The goal is to keep the kids in school because when they're out of school, that's when they get in trouble. So more suspensions, more expulsions, you can expect for there to be higher rates of violence in the community. Um, we offer grief support. We partner um, with Alive Hospice, and we take a group of children to the Alive Hospice grief retreat. But those students come back, and then they have consistent uh, grief support throughout the year, and we do that uh, through art, 
like painting, drawing, music, theater. Uh, we offer case management, mentorship. Our mentorship is with students who self-identify, families who self-identify, or they're referred to us um, through the schools or other community programs as being students who are high risk, which is and we also do at risk, but high risk, those are the students who are actively participating in street activity. And we're mentoring those students to help them to make better choices. And then we also um, have a rites of passage program for at risk children who um, maybe they're kind of getting in trouble, but they're not at a high risk level. And we have indicators for each to let us know kind of where this child fits and what their needs are. And most of that comes from home visits, meeting with the family, meeting with their teachers, even at their different schools. We offer family support groups, workshops. We have a youth action team. You will be hearing from them soon because they're doing a legislative uh, theater event where they're wanting you all to come and uh, brainstorm ways that maybe the city can work together with the students, but you do it through improvisational theater. And it is really fun. Um, we did one, I think, last week just for the community. And it's a blast. And you really come out with really great ideas. It gives you a way to talk about really heavy issues that are often hard for us to come together and talk about because you're using art and theater to do it. And um, we did that with the support of Metro Arts. And we're very grateful for them. Um, and then we also partner with the North Arts Collective. We did after school art programs. Um, and then, of course, there's the Cure Violence, Violence Interruption. And I do have uh, a one page front and back that uh, summarizes kind of what, what we do. And because of violence interruption, thank you so much, because the violence interruption program is new, so the violence interrupters were hired. Um, February, and we spent pretty much, you know, those first several weeks just in training and then community building. So just a lot of being in the community. And so like we will be fully launching, like they've definitely dealt with um, various situations already, but we will be ready to fully launch within like the next week. Um, and that issue really had a lot to do with finding office space in 37208 because there's not a lot of affordable rental space out there. Um, but we found somewhere um, thanks to one of our local churches. So um, does anybody have any questions? Yet yeah, there are some council members seeking recognition. Oh, that's right. Okay. Councilwoman Allen. Thank you. Um, having studied social emotional learning a lot last year, it sounds like y'all are doing some really important stuff and I'm, I'm impressed to hear with, with all you're doing. Just real quickly, how many people do y'all have on, on, is it staff or all volunteer and how many, how many kids do y'all think you reach? So there are seven people on staff. There are five full-time, two part-time. And then we also have, um, we have five interns this year um, one of our interns actually worked with the high school students just to make sure that they graduated. And every single one, we're still waiting on two of them to graduate because they're in um, a summer program. One ended up dropping out, but every single one of her students actually graduated except for those three. And two definitely will. She had 40 on her uh, caseload. Um, and then volunteers, we've got so many volunteers. I don't know how many exactly we have. And we counted on our role, the 600, it, well, the way that we do it is every time the students come into our room, we, um, they sign in. So there were 620 sign-ins of students who came into our room to talk to us, to, I mean, sometimes they come in for a hug and, and quick advice or to do their goals. Um, there were over 100 who went through the zone. There were, um, I, I need to, I, if I look at, there were, I think, 10 that were in the art program. Um, there are, were 70, seven, over 70 who were trained on the youth action team, probably 40, thank you, uh, who participated consistently. Uh, we had eight that went on the grief retreat. 
So I would say collectively somewhere around 300 students that um, we work with uh, in the community and in the school with multiple touches of these students. And when I talk about the students, like what we do is a whole family approach, which is why home visits are so important to us. And so this also includes like their siblings and their parents and their grandparents. We had one situation um, where there was a young man who uh, was killed some weeks ago and um, our trauma responder went in to the home and work with the family to plan his um, funeral and everything. But it, we work with, she worked with um, his aunt, his mother, and his grandmother as well to make sure that they had the services that they needed. But soon as this child passed away, the grandmother started having repeated heart attacks. She was, she was grieving really hard, and, and we personally really think that it was connected. We've seen it happen twice just this year and she passed away 10 days later. And so we were able to go back in and support that family. And those types of supports when violence occurs are just not available in that way in this city. There was a, mm -hmm. they also helped with the retaliation on that situation as well. Um, and then there was another, uh, another one where um, there was a man who was killed in North Nashville, and he had children in other, other states. And so we were able to connect with his family out of state to help them, because I didn't know who to contact for the children here also, but to look at victims' compensation to see if there's anything that these families can get following up because he was raising, helping to raise his partner's children, his girlfriend's children. So connecting with them as well and making sure to see them every week. I mean, she wasn't eating, so we brought food. So we do, we work with whole families. We touch a lot more than just the actual person that we're working with. Councilwoman Allen. Councilman Sledge. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's interesting you all came today because I just ran across, um, kind of going through our RFPs today, that I know that there's something out there right now regarding a victim of Prime Act funds that we do with re-engagement hubs and RFPs out to kind of or have partner organizations do those sorts of things. I don't want to get your hopes up too much because I think it closes tomorrow. But um, okay. but I know that there were things like that. What I wanted to ask you was, are there other partnerships regarding, um, you know, that you're already involved in with Metro? I mean, you're clearly doing a lot of work, like you said, with the Arts Commission. Can you give sort of a rundown of Metro-specific kind of the partnerships you've already developed? Yes. I would actually be very excited to tell you about those partnerships because I feel really I feel really proud of the way that our city showed up when we reached out to them. So in July, Cure Violence, um, we had them come and do an assessment visit. We invited every city agency that we felt was directly related to um, our cause. So uh, Metro Police were invited. Uh, we had representatives from Metro Schools, Juvenile Court, Housing, um, Metro Human Relations Commission, Metro Arts, um, I don't know, all those agencies at least, um, and they came together for a two-day workshop. So the first day, it wasn't even really a workshop, it was like a planning meeting to develop this, what, what you see here. So the first day they learned about the cure violence model, they learned about Gideon's Army because not every representative had a relationship with Gideon's Army. Um, and we took time to learn about them. And then the second day was looking at the maps and looking at the data so that we could collectively determine where would be the best place to start because we really want this to be as collaborative of a process as possible. And so that's how we ended up picking 37208 because we were personally torn because we went into each community and we did an informational session. So we did an informational session in North Nashville. We did J.C. Napier and Casey Holmes. And um, each community was highly responsive. And so we, we met with the communities, we met with the agencies, but when we looked at the data, it just made more 
strategic sense to start in the North Nashville um, community. We already have relationships there. We're already in the schools, but then there are other schools that could definitely use our support as well as the levels of violence as and the 37208 and the incarceration rates. So that's how we ended up there. Then um, I went and met with each a representative from each agency um, and did just a an analysis of kind of where they were and um, what their level of commitment would be able to be, what their interest was in doing it so that I could understand like what each agency could contribute as well as what they were willing to do and how willing they would be to participate. Um, and, and now we've hired some Opportunity Now students. And so now that we've actually done everything we said we were gonna do, like we've been keeping them updated along the way. But now that we've done everything that we said we would do as far as hiring the violence interrupters, kind of trying and mapping things out in the schools, we've reached back out to them. And the Opportunity Now students are going to um, lead this kind of coalition group. And we are being informed on how to do this from Unity, uh, is the Unity Prevention Institute. And they are really good at, um, at helping cities to build coalitions, city and community coalitions to stop violence. And they have so many resources and stuff online. So that's what I've been using to help guide the work so that we're strategic and not all over the place. And hopefully folks will stay involved. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that. It's thank very helpful. you so much. It, it seems like we have an organization that works very closely with several metro departments. So it concerns me a little bit that they may not have been contacted on an RFP that seems to be in their wheelhouse on this work. So, um, and I'm happy to share that with you afterward, but thank you. Um, it's good to know that we have an organization that works so closely with Metro and maybe we should take advantage of those assets. Thanks. Councilwoman Molina. Uh, Councilwoman Molina. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of questions on your funding sources as they stand now. Yes. And um, I want to echo a little bit of what Councilman Sledge said. I think what you guys do is great. Thank you so um, much. And I think that there's a lot of benefit in what you do. I'm a little concerned that A, you didn't know about this RFP, and that B, were you not aware that we had a process by which we fund these during the budget season? So I am new to this and okay. I am learning. I okay. did try to get in front of it and um, meet with the mayor. I did have a couple meetings with the mayor's office to kind of get a handle on it, understand that process, but I mean, it's just been very busy and it's hard to kind of keep in touch. Um, so I made an effort to do it. Um, one thing that um, I think for next year is like now I know and I'll be able to do it and be on top of it in time because um, uh, Mayor Briley's office did reach out but by the time I was, like, by the time I knew, it was just, it wasn't enough time for us to pull everything together. Right. So, right. but now I know and, and know how to do it and feel very confident. And I'd be curious, too, to know, as you share your funding sources, um, how you can scale this up. Because if it's that impactful in 208, there are definitely other pockets in the county that could benefit from a system that really works. Thank you. So um, I think one of the most valuable things that the city has given us was, um, so last year Mayor Briley did give us um, $15,000 to help kind of seed um, the program as a part of his youth violence packet. And as a part of that was consulting with Center for Nonprofit Management. And so we could choose from a variety of services, consulting services, we chose fundraising. And the fundraising consultant is phenomenal. And she was also very impressed with our fundraising plan because we've been really thorough. Um, I, I mean, it is something that I'm new to, but I, I've written every single one of the grants that we've gotten to be able to hire this team. 
Um, and that's part of it also is having, I mean, all of this is new, so I'm, I'm writing grants, I'm building programs, I'm having to hire people while also continuing to do the work in schools. And I'm a mother, I have a two-year-old, and I have adopted children. And, you know, these this, the children in the community are my children. They show up at the door all hours of the night, or they're calling, I'm picking them up from bus. So I think that was part of it also is just trying to do everything but it's been successful, so I will be on that for next year. Um, as far as the funding that um, we do get, we have been very honored to be funded um, by the Department of Human Services, and um, it's a two-generation grant, and they are so supportive. So it's really great to get this funding. Um, it is a $900,000 grant over a two-year period, and we just received the funding in December. So um, they provide a lot of mentoring to make sure that we know how to handle the funds. Um, we have bi-monthly phone calls. We do, of course, the reporting, and they have been extremely happy with our work, and we definitely make sure, I would say in Gideon's Army style, to always over deliver. Um, and then we've, uh, we were funded by the, uh, the, they just changed their name, but it was the Criminal Justice Initiative. It was small um, grant. Well, they actually funded us twice. They were really also impressed with our work. So we ended up getting $30,000 um, from them. So it was 15 and then 15. And then our intern that I was telling you about, she works with the high school students. She was the one who worked with our graduating seniors. She fell in love with us and, and wrote a grant through her class through the philanthropy lab. And originally they said they were gonna give us 7,000, but the class loved us so much that we got 18,000. And now um, they're looking at, they're going out to do a presentation to the philanthropy lab um, next week for another $25,000. Um, Spark Plug Foundation is um, an organization that we're applying to right now. Um, and those are, that's pretty much where our funding comes from, but we also have, like we have a donor, um, can I tell y'all a story just real quick? Okay, so Zara's dad, he drives for Lyft on the side, and he was telling his Lyft rider about Gideon's Army. A year later, we get a $20,000 check in the mail, and they call, and they said that they loved us so much, they're sorry it took so long to send it. But that is the money, because the, the thing is, is that the grant that we have is reimbursable, and so, like, I've, I've really had to raise money up front to be able to be reimbursed. And if, the, if reimbursement takes a while, then I got to raise money again. And so that's kind of where we were at that time is we needed money. And it came like manna from heaven, this check. So um, that also, we have donors, um, smaller donors, people who give monthly donations. Um, we're launching a membership campaign next month so just to do a lot more grassroots fundraising as well to give the communities that are impacted and all of these allies who love us an opportunity to also contribute um, and we also raise a good amount of money on facebook i think for um, giving tuesday it was our very first time raising money um, of course we didn't get the match but um, we raised like $7,000 in two days on Facebook. And so I know that as we continue to systematize our fundraising efforts, that Gideon's Army can be something that is sustainable. And we get calls from other cities all the time to come out and do some of this work, some from you know surrounding, but um, we really want to, to do well here first to do well here first. And then we'll also be offering trainings where people can pay for that as well, like having some um, other economic models. Thank you so much. Chair, that's all I had. Councilwoman Henderson. Thank you, Chair Bircher, and thank you uh, for your work. I wanted to ask, so cure violence and that cure violence national model, are they solely an 
educational entity wherein they come, they do the assessment, you do the planning, and so they're a facilitator, or I know that they're funded by like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and they have other funders, but are they a grant making entity or they are a grant recipient that then works with community partners to render services? Could you explain that Cure Violence partnership and how that works from a funding perspective? Um, from a funding perspective, Cure Violence wants $150,000 from us to be able to work with them fully. Okay. Um, they, they really like us because, I mean, they said in their 10-year history, we're the first organization that's ever come to them directly from all over the world to do this work and raise the money to at least get them here and to get things started. Um, I'm not exactly sure how they're funded um, as far as grants are concerned, but we are not recipients of anything that they receive. Um, and I feel like I'm so, missing a question. Okay, so they are a nonprofit entity, but they are rendering services based on their model that's sort of organizational yes. services. So you're, I guess, to partner with them, you have to make a commitment to raise X dollars to be a member of their cure violence yeah network, so they're or? consultants okay that's what that's what they are consultants okay. with nonprofit status and okay. they've just been willing to to work with us with with where we are and when you spoke of the department of human services is that the state of tennessee's department yes. of human services okay i appreciate yes. that and then from the mayor's administration the 15k and seed funding last year I um, appreciate that to get you over with the Center for Nonprofit Management and get that going so that you can raise the money to do. And I, so I think that was yes. an, an excellent investment. I, I would just like to understand, though, along the same lines of um, uh, Council Lady Wiener's questions and Councilman Sledge's questions as to the larger RFP and Chair Vircher, I think, you know, we had this conversation last budget season that we wanted to make sure as a body that we were making... Uh, strategic aligned investments with our nonprofit community. Clearly, they are partnering with Metro Police and all these various entities. So, you know, these are the kind of partnerships that we were talking about last year in budget season. And so I am just confused somewhat at the disconnect as it relates to the, uh, the administration. Can, can you help me understand, like, why they're not reflected in the budget book, or are they? Are they asking for more? And then why the administration did not attempt to, I mean, basically the, the back of the budget book with the nonprofit entities all worthy, and we appreciate them. It they is are in, not listed. Okay, it, but it is, though Gideon's Army not listed, that list is just like it was last year. Like, we, we did not, I don't think from the administration side, see any sort of kind of tailoring of that list to be in specific priority areas like youth violence and so forth. So can the administration speak to, I mean, why based on that established, are, are, are you, they were not reflected here in the budget book? Uh, Council, we can give you a more uh, precise answer uh, tomorrow. I know there was a change in process about how it was distributed and there was a process going through the department, but we can go give you more definite information. I'd very much like to understand that process because I think Chair Virtue and I very specifically asked Director Lloyd Max O'Neill last year that we not get to this place again in the budget season where okay. we're, you know, I mean, we, we want to make these strategic investments with entities that are doing good work, that are fundraising, that are aligned with missions. Obviously, the mayor has made it a priority, as has this council, um, to address our, our youth violence concerns. So uh, it's just concerning to me that, you know, we're at this stage where the we then have to, you know, we referred to it last budget season as like, you know, the nonprofits hunger games. Like, you know, we all go to the back of the book, administrative at glance, there they all are. And we just, you know, well, let's take 20 from this one and give 10 to that one and do, you know, so I would like to see strategically from a leadership perspective, I don't understand why y'all's office did not address this. I, I guess so I'd like to understand that and just have an understanding about all the nonprofits that are in the back of this book. Why are they here? Are they aligned with street 
strategic priorities? Or are they just the same exact nonprofits that were in this book last year with the same exact appropriation amount? Because it appears to me to be the latter. Um, so if you all could respond on that, I would be grateful because I think it would help us understand how best we as a body can make these changes at this juncture to, you know, can support entities that are doing all the right things, right? They're partnering with all the right metro departments. They're aligned with strategic priorities. But, you know, we're in an awkward spot now at this point in the budget season. So I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you Rita so much, Councilwoman Berger. Henderson. Uh, Ms. Fertuga, how much did you, your organization raise to bring Cure Violence to the city? Um, it was about 25000 Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's you, Fabian. And if, can I say something? Quickly? Go ahead. Um, we also, well, the violence interrupters, you want to? Okay, so uh, pulled together people from the North Nashville community to coordinate a ceasefire. And this is a process. We're at the beginning of the process, but we did have several people who committed to that. And um, it was something else that I was going to say. Oh, about the budget process. So one thing that I would like for you all to know, I wasn't really sure if I should talk about it or not, is that it's really hard for new organizations to get money because, okay, so we weren't, let's say we weren't funded until December. And then the RFPs, all that stuff, I think may have been due by January. We didn't get our first check till January, but it requires that you have an independent audit in order to get money, but then we didn't have any money to pay for an audit to say that we don't have any money. So <laughs> it kind of keeps organizations that are grassroots, that have proven themselves, that have you know raised money, but maybe the money hasn't come in yet. It's very um, disenfranchising to us um, and to other uh, smaller organizations who are also out here doing kind of grassroots level work. And I have two of our violence interrupters with us and two of our students as well, um, just in case you all had questions for them um, or not, but yeah. they're here. And thank you for also being here. Councilman Bettany. This is why I um, keep pushing for particip participatory budgeting. Uh, participatory budgeting empowers uh, communities to decide what is the best way to invest the portion of the budget that impacts them. And it removes some of the uh, hardships that small nonprofits like this one have to face in trying to get the resources they need to serve the community that they are part of. Uh, so I have been involved with nonprofits before. I know how hard it is for a nonprofit to meet that, uh, get, go through that initial uh, moment on when they are trying to make it work and start raising money and fundraising efforts. Uh, we don't have a dedicated funding source for uh, uh, our commitment to nonprofits. As a matter of fact, I have heard again and again some of the council members want to eliminate funding to nonprofits. So, what nonprofit wants to spend months working on writing a grant to get a, an amount of money from the city when they don't know if it will be included in next year's budget when it's so hard to spend the time doing that? So, I think part of the uh, mistake here is asking the council. We need to make it absolutely clear that we believe in the, what nonprofits do for the city, how they help us save money uh, in dealing with very unique problems that our residents face. The city bureaucracy, uh, it's like a big sledgehammer, and sometimes you need a, a, a small hammer to deal with the problem, and nonprofits help us do that. So I'm, I'm really putting it back on us to, to streamline the process and to make it more effective and to show in no uncertain terms that we are committed to partnering with nonprofits to help us solve Nashville's problems year after year. That's the problem we face with the bonds fund. There is no dedicated funding source, so developers don't know if there will be money there next year or two years down the road. We need to make that statement that we are committed to this. And uh, sorry for the speech, but I was just trying to explain why I think some of these nonprofits struggle. It's okay, it's the climate. Go ahead, Councilman Bettany. Thank you, Chair. That was, that was my speech. Mm -hmm. Ms. Fertuga, any other council member seeking recognition? 
Councilwoman Porterfield. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, again, I just want to speak to the merit of Gideon's Army, uh, their, their programming. When I was working last school year at Pearl Cone High School, I was able to see firsthand the work that Ms. Fatuga was doing. And when students would have conflict uh, during the school year and conflict uh, in the hallways or in the classroom, and Ms. Fatuga was uh, orchestrating peace circles and teaching conflict resolution skills that our students sometimes don't have the opportunity to learn at home. And when we don't resolve those issues, they do spill out outside of the school. They do spill out into the community and it spills out into a bigger problem. And you're dealing with retaliation, with gun violence and things of that nature. So um, the work that the, the violence interrupters are doing, it is so important to our community and it's so important to the city of Nashville. We see every single day, I'm sure your constituents are telling you the same way my constituents are telling me about their concerns with uh, youth violence and the actions of some of our youth. And we have an organization here on the front lines that um, is working diligently to um, address that. And unfortunately, because they are a grassroots organization, they are just now going through their funding processes. They didn't have the, the funding to go through the RFP process with the audit and things of that nature. So I just ask that uh, you all strongly consider the funding for the organization. Again, I can attest to their merits. I have seen them firsthand. Um, our violence interrupters literally place their bodies on the front line. It, and I'm not sure if Ms. Fatuga spoke on that because I apologize, I, I stepped in late. But our violence interrupters get in between people that are having arguments, that are having confrontations, and they are on the front lines trying to resolve the conflict, trying to make sure that there's not further violence and trying to make sure that there's not uh, retaliation and they're doing an amazing job. So thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Porterfield. Ms. Fertuga and Gideon's Army and, and the students back there, thank you so much for being here and presenting your information as it relates to your organization, to the Budget and Finance Committee and council members. The work that you do for our youth and for the city, it does not go unnoticed. So thank you for being here. Thank That's Belly Yum Yum. Yes, yeah. Belly Yum Yum. Say thank you so much. Um, I want, can I also say the people that we hired are from the community also. They're from the community, these are community legends, and they're like superheroes when they're walking around because the kids, like the people already know them. They have this incredible credibility from having turned their own lives around. And so not only are we working to serve the community, but all of the people that we hired and our youth action team, they um, planned out the questions, they got trained like in the way that Cure Violence hires, and they actually did the interviews and they selected um, the violence interrupters, called and told them, you know, that, that they wanted them to be um, their violence interrupters. So it was very student-led also. So I just want to throw it Thank out Thank you so much. Give her some honey and, and some lemon for that cough. Okay, Budget and Finance Committee members and council members, um, you requested an additional work session. Um, for those that joined, um, I gave an update as it related to the, the HMIS. Um, Councilman Sledge also provided us an update as it related to, to his supplement. Um, Councilwoman Wiener um, put in a request for NCAT. Councilwoman Wiener, do you want to speak for that? Um, although um, uh, some council members spoke to it um, at our last work session, um, if you want to add anything, you can. Thank you, Chair. Um, insofar as NECAT is concerned, I have had the opportunity to, to witness what they've done, and they bring students in. They have put students on a path of, for their careers. They have offered an opportunity for these children to have um, engagement at an early level, and um, I, I can't imagine that um, a, a program that's this important and this impactful um, that we have supported year over year is one that we would not seek to fund yet again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, Councilman Mendez, because we have committee members and council members here that wasn't here last time, do you want to uh, briefly go through um, your, your proposed substitute, if you have it? I know the FAQs was uh, emailed midday. Um, We'll do that if, if there's any additional questions or not. 
once you do that, we can we can adjourn if anyone has any, any additional questions for, for me. Councilman Mendez. Uh, thanks. Um, I do appreciate that. Uh, I'm not necessarily mentally prepared to do it, um, but uh, I'll dive in um, and I'll keep it brief because uh, I know it's on the video for the meeting last week. The um, substitute that Councilman Davis and I and uh, I think several others have signed on to already um, would basically be very similar to last year's proposal. Um, it's just a two cent different on the rate adjustment and the um, fundamental starting point is to recognize that uh, um, the city has just flat stopped uh, thinking about setting revenue the way it did for about 25 years from about 1980 to about 2005. During that time period, the rate was, address, was adjusted um, once every three and a half years or so, and since 05, it's been adjusted once to match the needs of a growing city, and as outlined in the frequently asked questions that were sent around today, the need um, on the budget just to get through this fiscal year, uh, FY20 and FY21, is something like uh, approaching 250 thousand dollars and the anticipate above what's in the uh, mayor's proposed budget and uh, after you deduct out expected um, revenue growth you get down to a need over two years of about 162 million above and beyond what's in the mayor's budget um, and that re uh, breaks down to a 52 cent rate correction um, the uh, when I say all, the, all that need above what's in the mayor's budget, just to briefly go through it, um, the uh, substitute that we're proposing would cover um, 26 million, uh, 26.8 million more in additional funding for um, MNPS. Um, it would keep us from having to rely on these non-recurring one-time transactions um, for the DES and the parking. Then if those things happen, there'd be surplus funds rather than having to base an operating budget around it. We heard at the last meeting that there's gonna be a, um, likely a bond issuance at the end of tw uh, fiscal um, 21, um, en end of calendar 2020. And uh, there's no money built in the budget right now to take care of that, so we'd add money for that. Um, we would cover uh, COLA and school increases for next year, as well as um, basic inflation, um, and uh, benefits have been held flat for a couple years, and it would build in $10 million um, for benefits. All these numbers, um, just like last year, were, were vetted by finance. And then the last uh, new thing that would be covered would be uh, replenishing fund balance of $27 million for this year. And um, I've had several questions about um, what that's for and uh, what everybody has to, um, I would submit, remember, is that if you want to have a budget last for a couple years, you need to have a little bit of a surplus in the first year in order to match growing cost in the second year. And so that uh, replenishing the funds balance, um, anytime you have a, a, a rate that is designed to last for multiple years, the idea should be to have a surplus in the beginning of the period and then uh, eat it up um, in the end of the period. That's how you make it a few years. So that's the purpose for 27 uh, million to um, be able to make it through two years and, and to have some room uh, for surprises. Um, and that, in a nutshell, is what's proposed, um, what the sources would be and what the uses would be. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you so much, Councilman Mendez. Before we adjourn, just want to remind you again, we are meeting tomorrow at 5 for a joint meeting on budget and finance planning zone and historical for the review of the CIB. Uh, and to consider the amendments. Also, any additional updates or changes, any ideas, make sure you're not communicating with me directly, that you communicate through uh, Mike Jamison and staff, and, they will, and he will forward that um, accordingly. Thank you, Budget and Finance Committee members and council members. Thank you, council staff and the administration. This concludes our budget work session. Our next discussion as it relates to the budget will be passing one. Thank you so much. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.net.